Y'all get ready. Yes, you get ready. You want the latest news in the streets? Join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sell your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Hey, tea sippers. I hope you guys are doing good today. So it has been a crazy day on social media. Literally all day, Meek Mill and Diddy and Usher have been trending because more information have leaked from that lawsuit from Little Rod. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kind of pick up what we left off yesterday. So this is kind of like the quote unquote part two. And speaking of part two, my volume two of uh, my Diddy, of my deep dive concerning the downfall of Sean P. Diddy Combs, volume two is out now. So make sure you guys check it out. So anyhow, we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna read to you guys what is going on in this court case now that the paperwork has leaked onto the internet. So we're gonna, we left off on line 73 um, of that so-called alleged video of Stevie J and the Caucasian male. And so the next line under that on page 13, it says number five, he is a Philadelphia rapper who dated Nicki Minaj. Remember when I was saying that they had a rapper's name redacted and it said an R&B singer name redacted on line 71 right here? Well, if you scroll down to number five, it says it's a Philadelphia rapper who dated Nicki Minaj. The only Philly rapper that dated Nicki Minaj, as we all know, is Meek Mill. Then number six says he performed at the Super Bowl and had a very successful Vegas residency. Okay, can y'all guess who that is? Ding, 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 Usher. So this whole situation is insane. Then they also said this writer is in possession of a video and will provide a copy to the court. So it looks like he also has some type of video as well. So then um, on the next page, page 14, we already hit on that. That was the whole situation with Young Miami and the cousin. We also hit on the sex trafficking part. So I'm going to go to this part, number 84, the sex workers that Mr. Combs forced Mr. Jones to bring back to his home. On about February 2nd, 2023, Mr. Jones believed that Mr. Combs drugged him. Mr. Jones recalls waking up naked and dizzy and confused. He was in bed with two sex workers and Mr. Combs. He also recalls aimlessly wandering around the house with no clothes on. And you can see he has like pictures and stuff here. And that looks like it could be Sean Diddy Combs. Then he goes on to say, on another occasion in Miami, Florida, on Thanksgiving night of 2022, Mr. Combs asked Mr. Jones and D. Forrest Taylor to enter the studio bathroom. He asked for a $100 bill because he wanted them to do cocaine with him. Mr. Jones was scared, but luckily he didn't have a $100 bill. So Mr. Combs waited a little later to do coke with Young Miami. So Young Miami's all up and through this lawsuit. But like we said on my live stream a few months ago, birds of a feather flock together. She's no different than Diddy. That's why she's more busy beefing with YouTubers than calling out her demonic boyfriend. Because she's one and the same with Diddy. She's trying to do anything for fame because she has no real talent. She can't rap. She lucked up being in the City Girls. So now it seems like she's taking on the persona of being one of Diddy's little madams, okay? I can't say it. You got to. It say take a shot if you like golden showers, I do. Golden showers? Meaning when the guy pees on you? Mm -hmm. Pee on you everywhere? You like it? I just like it. So then he goes on to say later that evening... He required Mr. Jones to solicit sex work from Booby Trap on the river located at 3615 Northwest River Drive in Miami, Florida. Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones did so. Mr. Combs forced him to engage in unsolicited sex acts with these workers. Then they provide the pictures here, a booby trap on the river. They then go on to say as part of Mr. Jones' sex work recruitment tool, Mr. Combs provided Mr. Jones with an exclusive bad boy baseball cap and required him to wear it to the booby trap on the river as a signal to any sex worker he approached that Mr. Combs was in town and had sent Mr. Jones to recruit them. Mr. Jones had no desire to visit the booby trap on the river. Mr. Jones had no desire to solicit sex workers from booby trap on the river. 
Mr. Combs used his power and influence to intimidate and force Mr. Jones into solicitating sex workers from the booby trap on the river. Is detailed down below. Mr. Combs uses many tactics to maintain dominion and control over Mr. Jones. Apparently, these workers were accustomed to servicing Mr. Combs and would know that he was in town by the sight of the Bad Boys baseball cap. The following are Instagram profiles of the two sex workers that Mr. Combs required Mr. Jones to solicit and have sex with at his home in Miami, Florida. So like we've always said on this channel, a lot of people on Instagram and on OnlyFans are simply using those as tools to sell pussy. Let's keep that real. All that I'm a model and I'm a baddie. No, you're, you're just a high class escort. Nothing wrong with that. Get your money, honey. But stop trying to act like you're better than everybody because you sell pussy for a living. Okay. So then they go on to say this. Mr. Jones has no desire to solicit or have any sex with these individuals in the previous paragraph. Mr. Combs used his power and influence to intimidate and force Mr. Jones into not only soliciting, but sleeping with these women. And that is scary because, again, these women are prostitutes. And a lot of times they don't use protection, you know, because a lot of times these guys don't like to use protection. So now he's forcing Mr. Jones to put himself at risk. What if one of these women had you know, chlamydia or herpes or HIV. I mean, that is a very scary thought that he'd be forced into having sex with two people that he did not want to have sex with. Then they go on to say the following is the phone number of another sex worker that Mr. Combs required Mr. Jones to solicit and perform sex acts at his home in Miami. Then they go on to say Mr. Combs used his tactics to maintain dominion and control over Mr. Jones. He promised him Grammy for producer of the year for the Love Album. He offered him $250,000 to purchase all the instruments he wanted. He promised him ownership of his $20 million property, One Star Island in Miami. He promised access to record label executives like Defendant Lucian Grange and Ethiopia Habitamarian. Mr. Combs would often switch up his approach. He would go from promising Mr. Jones the world to threatening Mr. Jones with physical harm. Mr. Combs threatened to eat Mr. Jones's face and inform Mr. Jones that he's willing to kill his mother, Janice Combs, if he must in order to get what he wants so he wouldn't think twice about harming Mr. Jones. So this shows you how much of a psychopath Diddy is, that the same mother that he's always kissing on and rubbing on her feet and acting like that's his old ass girlfriend, he's willing to kill her. So if he's wanting to kill his own mama who birthed him, I wonder what happened to Kim. But that's a whole nother video, child. So then on line 98, they say, on or about July 2nd, 2023 in California, Mr. Jones had a listening party at his home. Present at the party were R&B artists redacted, Jay Combs, sex workers, and some underage girls. The event began at 7 p.m. Mr. Combs requested female sex workers and required Mr. Jones to solicit them. An hour later, several sex workers appeared. In addition to sex workers, there were at least five women in the crowd that were under the age of 16. Okay? Mr. Combs forced all the women to drink Lace Daily on liquor. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs laced the liquor with ecstasy. Mr. Combs did not check the identification of any of these underage girls. The presence of these underage women, they're not women if they're underage, okay? The presence of these underage, we're going to call them what they are, girls, made Mr. Jones very uncomfortable. He attempted to leave. Mr. Combs forced him to stay. Mr. Jones went on... Mr. Combs went so far to take Mr. Jones's car keys to prevent him from leaving. After being forced to drink the Lace de Leon shots, Mr. Jones began, began feeling lightheaded and recalls passing out and waking up around 4 a.m. the following morning naked with the sex worker sleeping next to him. Screenshots of a video from that night are embedded below. Now, this is what they're going to say about that redacted singer. If you go down here where it says number nine, he is a Grammy award-winning R&B singer who had trouble with law enforcement after assault a Bayesian billionaire. So that sounds like Chris Brown, but I could be mistaken. I don't know if Chris Brown has a Grammy. He may. But when I think about a billionaire, I think about uh, Rihanna. So then he goes on to provide some pictures, Mr. Combs with underage girls, the sex workers, and Justin Combs with underage girls. So it looks like Justin Combs, um, because he's young and he looks young, he's definitely one of the people who are procuring these young girls for his father, okay? So then line 109 says, Mr. Jones believes that Mr. Combs was grooming him to pass him off to his friends. 
This fear became a reality when Mr. Combs introduced him to Mr. Cuba Gooding Jr., which they were on Mr. Combs's yacht. And then he provides the picture of them in the studio with Cuba Gooding Jr. And you notice his studio is red. So pay attention to the fact that his studio is red, okay? And we read about the situation with Cuba Gooding Jr. in the first video. You guys can go back and watch that. Um, let me kind of skip forward here. So then around, okay, so now we get to the love album part. Uh, throughout his time with Mr. Combs, Mr. Jones was under implied work for hire agreement. He was not compensated for the time living with Mr. Combs. For the songs he produced as evidence, he was listed as a producer for the following songs on the Love Album's final release. Mr. Combs and the defendant, LR, MR, UMG, are benefited from Mr. Jones's work and product, and they failed to compensate Mr. Jones for his work. As a result, Mr. Combs and the defendant, LR, MR, UMG, were all unjustly enriched at the expense of Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones attempted to work with Mr. Combs to secure his publishing and royalty rights for the work he completed on the Love Album. Mr. Combs only offered Mr. Jones $29,000 for 13 months and thousands of hours of work and nine songs that made it to the Love Album. Ironically, Mr. Jones was willing to take 50 grand in his publishing and royalties. Mr. Combs' self-serving greed would not allow him to pay Mr. Jones the additional $21,000. So again, his tactics have not changed. If you guys watched my first Diddy Deep Dive, this man has been doing this since the 90s, where literally he'll jump on people's albums, trying to be seen and, you know, throw his voice in there so that way he can get some of that publishing. He can get some of those royalties. And he's never in the studio. He's never the one writing the tracks, really putting in the work. He's the one running around, you know, kicking it, pretending to be brother love, all the while assaulting people while his, you know, his, his workers, his worker bees are the ones who are really putting in the work for all the music that went platinum and got plaques at Bad boys. Diddy was not the one behind the success. It was everybody else from Mace to Black Rob um, to Faith Evans to Little Kim, Biggie, New Edition. Everybody was in there writing and busting their ass except for Diddy. And let's not forget g Depp as well. So then they go on to say this, Mr. Combs' deceptive business practices became so bad that Mr. Jones was left with no choice other than to make a public plea on social media for Mr. Combs to pay him for his work. After publicly requesting that Mr. Combs do the right thing and pay him fairly, Mr. Jones received an onslaught of threatening messages from Stevie J and the Love Records and a and R D. Forrest Taylor. And so he went on to provide um, a screenshot of D. Forrest basically going in on him and saying, LOL, you are 100% a liar and a weirdo. Good luck. Number still the same. Run into nigga. Come talk to me in public on a public podcast and forum. According to Mr. Jones, Mr. Combs was very forcefully, was very forceful and demanding. Mr. Combs did not take no for an answer and would often threaten to inflict bodily harm on Mr. Jones if he did not comply with his demands. As detailed above, Mr. Combs threatened to eat Mr. Jones's face. On another occasion, while standing in Mr. Combs' bedroom, Mr. Jones was forced to watch as Mr. Combs displayed his guns and bragged about getting away with shooting people. Mr. Combs shared that he was responsible for the shooting in the nightclub in New York City with rapper Shine. Okay, y'all remember the shooting that took place in 1999. So this was some really interesting tidbits. He shared that artist and Mr. Combs' girlfriend at the time, Jennifer Lopez, a.k.a. J-Lo, carried the gun into the club for him and passed him the gun after he got into an altercation with another individual. So J-Lo, again, just as, you know, rowdy, rowdy, bowdy, bowdy, but they made her off to be, you know, this Latina princess who had no idea what was going on. And she was just swept up by the, you know, by the glitz and glam. And she was so innocent. But now he's saying under oath that J-Lo was the one who carried the gun in. Okay. Um, and a lot of rappers talk about that. I gave my girl the pistol and she carried it in the club for me because women don't get searched as hard as guys. So then they go on to say the shooting at Chadless Recording Studio confirmed Mr. Combs' statement. The statement reinforced that Mr. Jones' fear of Mr. Combs and strengthened Mr. Combs' dominion and control over Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones was terrified of Mr. Combs and felt like he could not tell him no. Mr. Combs constantly made it clear that he has immense power in the music industry and with law enforcement. Mr. Combs made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Mohammed, a.k.a. Mr. Muhammad, had the power to make people and problems disappear. 
And this is a picture of Fahim Muhammad. You know, beautiful smile. He looks innocent, but I guess he's a goon behind the scenes. So then they go on to say, Mr. Combs instructed his staff to always contact Mr. Muhammad if they are ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. Upon the information and belief, Mr. Muhammad spoke with the LAPD after G was shot at CRS and the LAPD was in CRS and witness to the blood in the restroom. They went with the bogus claim that the shooting of G occurred outside the studio. This was all thanks to Mr. Muhammad's connection with law enforcement. Mr. Jones has no reason to disbelieve Mr. Combs as he has firsthand as he has firsthand through the shooting of G and subsequent silence of the LAPD in the media that Mr. Combs indeed had the power to harm him. LAPD spent hours at CRS after the shooting of G, yet there were no arrests. Mr. Jones witnessed the LAPD in the restroom, picture above, yet no arrests were made. The morning after the shooting, Mr. Jones and several others arrived at CRS and G's blood was still there on the floor of the restroom and Mr. Combs hired a cleaning crew to clean it up. So then they go ahead and talk about the whole connection with Diddy and um, uh, Mr. Grange. So they're saying that the defendant Grange visited Combs' home in Miami, Florida and in Los Angeles. According to Mr. Jones, whenever defendant Grange, um, who is Lucian Grange, by the way, visited Mr. Combs at his home, it would be in the evening, and he and Mr. Combs would disappear for hours in Mr. Combs' bedroom. Defendant Grange sponsored and attended several love album listening parties at Mr. Combs' home in Los Angeles. Uh, these parties were sponsored by the defendants MR, LR, and UMG. As evident above, the parties had sex workers, underage girls present. During these parties, defendant Garange knew or should have known that Mr. Combs was drugging the attendees through lace bottles of De Leon tequila and Ciroc vodka. Okay? Neither of which this idiot owned. He was a glorified influencer. But it's very interesting that, you know, he tried to sue De Leon for racism and everything else, but he was doing a lot of nefarious shit with De Leon liquor. And this is another reason why De Leon ended up suing him and breaking their contract with Diddy because this is not a good look for their brand. Not that I drink anyways, but if I did drink, I would not touch a bottle of Ciroc or De Leon just because the whole connection to this is disgusting. Um, they also go on to say that it's no secret that Mr. Combs has specific bottles of alcohol designated for females and other bottles designated for staff, his artists, and himself. The fact was detailed by former artists and bodyguards of Mr. Combs. As a sponsor of these events, defendant Garange had the duty and obligation to ensure that sex workers and underage girls were not present and that Mr. Combs was not spiking alcohol with date rape drugs. Then they're going to talk about the Art of Dialogue YouTube channel and how Gene Deal and also um, Mark Curry had exposed them. Right, right. But speaking of Harvey Pierre, how do you feel about him getting accused of sexual assault? Uh, like I said, anything that has to do with those sexual assaults, those people have to prove that. But is it are they capable? Yeah, they're capable. Look at the atmosphere. They in the music industry. They in the music business. They set up those type of, uh, uh, they they learn the tricks of the trade. For instance, guys don't put those pills that they get to the girls in the champagne bottles because they popping them in front of them. Most of those girls especially if they like mixed drinks. You understand? They see the bottles when they open them and they trying to keep their eyes on because they don't want to get no kind of drugs put in their system. But what they don't understand is in the orange juice and it's in the cranberry juice. They didn't put the pills and the stuff in there, the roofies, the ecstasy, the ease, all whatever they they put it in the juice. Now, those girls who like the mixed drinks, you understand what I'm saying? They gonna pour their own sexual act because they don't understand it ain't in the bottles, it's in the juice. So then they go on to say, according to Mr. Jones, defendant Ethiopia, I can't read her last name. We're just going to call it Ethiopia. Visited Mr. Combs at the defendant's CRS during Mr. Combs' writing camp. 
Defendant Ethiopia um, sponsored and attended several love album listening parties at Mr. Combs' home in Los Angeles. These parties were sponsored by Defendant MR, LR, and UMG. Um, is evident above. Those parties had sex workers and underage girls present. During these parties, defendant Ethiopia knew or should have known that Mr. Combs was drugging the attendees through lace bottles of De Leon tequila and Ciroc vodka. As a sponsor of these events, defendant uh, Ethiopia had the duty and obligation to ensure that these sex workers and underage girls were not present and that Mr. Combs were not spiking alcohol with date rape drugs. So basically saying, you know, that's one of his right hand women and she was there and she was very privy to what was going on. Then they go on to say, um, defendant Christina Corham is the Ghislaine Maxwell to Sean Combs's Jeffrey Epstein. And that's that older white woman when the case first came out, um, with Cassie when she sued Diddy and those pictures came out a few days later where he had his pants tucked into his socks and he was looking stressed out. Well, that white lady that was in the picture with him, that is his quote unquote bootleg Ghislaine Maxwell. And they're saying, according to Mr. Jones, during the 13 months that he lived and traveled with Mr. Combs, he witnessed Mr. Combs display and distribute guns from his bedroom and closet in Miami, Florida and Los Angeles to questionable individuals dressed in all black. According to Mr. Jones, during the 13 months that he lived and traveled with Mr. Combs, he witnessed defendant Corham openly order her assistance to keep Mr. Combs high off the gummies and pills. Defendant Corham required all employees from the butler and chef to housekeepers to walk around with pouches or fanny pack filled with cocaine, GHB, ecstasy, marijuana gummies, 15 to 250 milligrams each, and 2C, a pink drug that is a combination of ecstasy and cocaine. So this man is a full-blown drug addict at this point from what he's saying and from what Cassie is saying as well. Then they go on to talk about a man named Brandon Paul and Frankie Stant Stantella. Alongside Brandon, um, while Brandon acquires and distributes uh, Mr. Combs' drugs and guns, Frankie carries the money and pays for the drugs and guns. Uh, here goes a picture of Frankie Santella and Sean Combs. Um, Moy Bon hires sex workers and attends and participates in freak offs. This is Moya Bon. Um, Thanksgiving 2022, when Mr. Combs offered Mr. Jones cocaine, uh, Mr. Combs funded and used his affiliation with local gang and gang leaders who were frequent his home in LA, Miami to secure drugs and guns he obtained and distributed out of his home in LA, Miami. Defendants executed their RICO enterprise with threats of violence, threatening to eat the plaintiff's face, displaying and distributing guns in the plaintiff's presence, bragging about having law enforcement under their control, bragging about murdering people, bragging about bribing witnesses and jurors in the criminal case concerning the 1999 NYC nightclub shooting with Shine. Defendants executed their RICO enterprise with thoughts of isolation from music and entertainment industry, parading powerful music execs such as defendant Lucian Grange, uh, Ethiopia at his parties filled with sex workers and minors, illegal drugs such as ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms. Defendant executed their RICO enterprise with thoughts of non-payment for work and completed fake promises of cash payments of $250,000, producer of the year Grammy Awards, granted access to future projects, and a $20 million home on Star Island in Miami. Then he goes on to say, while living and traveling with Mr. Combs, Mr. Jones discovered that Mr. Combs has hidden cameras in every room of his home. Mr. Jones believed that Mr. Combs was recording the defendant Lucian Charles Grange and Ethiopia, as well as other celebrities, label execs, politicians, athletes. Upon information and belief, these individuals were recorded without their knowledge and consent, as in the case with the homosexual sex tape of Stevie J that Mr. Combs provided to Mr. Jones. Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage of every person that has attended his freak off parties and his house parties. Upon information and belief due to this treasure trove of evidence he has in his possession, Mr. Combs believe, believes that he's above the law and is untouchable. This very much sounds like Jeffrey Epstein. He did the same thing. Remember, he was trained by Mossad. And it sounds like Diddy is running his own bootleg Mossad 
down there in Miami and in Cali. So this is very, very interesting stuff that's being stated in this lawsuit. Um, they also go on to say that um, upon information and belief, Mr. Combs' employee, Jose Cruz, is his IT director. This writer has spoken to several former employees of Mr. Combs, who confirmed that Jose Cruz is the gatekeeper of all of Mr. Combs' recording. Upon information and belief that Jose Cruz intentionally hides cameras, hides behind cameras, and from social media and the internet due to all incriminating acts that he has that he was required to record for Mr. Combs. And they have his number in here redacted, Jose Puff's tech guy, Cali. Then they go on to say, as the respondent superior defendant, Lucian Charles Grange, Ethiopia Habitamarian, Combs Global, Motown Records, Love Records, Universal Music Group, um, are 100% liable for the actions of Sean Combs, Justin Combs, Christina Coran, as they were acting in their capacities as respondent superior collectives. Employees, when they committed the acts detailed below, the respondent superior collective failed to adequately monitor, warn, or supervise the actions of Sean Combs, Justin Combs, or Christina Corham. All right, so you guys just watched me read like that whole document. So of course, like I said earlier, Diddy and Meek Mill have been trending all day. So once Meek Mill got wind of this, because DJ Academics had also spoke on it too, he was in his feelings. He went off. So I'm going to go ahead and play you guys a clip of DJ Academics, and then they're back and forth on social media. He did not, it, it did not say Meek Mill name. Wait. Oh, oh, hold up. Never mind. Wait, what the fuck? I forgot. Look, Mr. Combs informed Mr. Jones that he had engaged in sexual intercourse with rapper five. That's redacted. Look, five. He's a Philadelphia rapper who dated Nicki Minaj. Yo, Meek, we were playing around with that Michael Rubin shit. But if you don't, you've been tweeting about, every, nigga, you've been tweeting about everything on planet Earth. If you don't get a Twitter rant saying you about to get Lil Rod killed, you about to shoot up his block, blow his mama's house up. This nigga is saying that you and Diddy were fornicating. What the fuck? Meek. All right, so you guys just saw what DJ Academics had to say. So this is what Meek Mill said. He says, academics did not tell you to stop playing with my name. I don't know what I'm going to do when I actually see you. It's going to have a combination to it, though. Act replies back and says, wait, did you blame me for what a lawsuit said? Like I just made it up? LOL. No way. Then he says, honestly, I don't even think Meek is gay, but it's weird as fuck that he got on Elon Musk's Twitter to blame me for what a lawsuit said and promote a song. LOL. Dog, you know you can just say that's not true. They're lying. Bruh, Dunn dropped his trailer more times than SoundCloud links. This is a treacherous rollout if you ask me. Pause. Yeah. Then Meek says, DJ Academics is an alcoholic, fully powered by the white man. Who you think posting that on every website? They be so mad. They can't stop. It's few groups. LOL. Ax says, nah, this nigga burnt out. A producer caught him in Diddy Gay. He's mad at everybody and addressing everything but that. Nigga said, I made it up. Then Meek says, get me his Addy. I'm going to shoot a full production music video in front of his house. Seriously, get me that one in New Jersey. Axe says, cut the bunny hopping fake gangster shit out. You were formed, nigga. You were killer until you shoot a video in front of Dean's house. I don't want to see this on social media. You wild and trying to promote your whack song. Then he says, I'm from Philly. I don't do coke or freaky ass Molly. Nobody won't even offer me no coke because, because I'm that heavy. No man or whatever approach me about gay activity. The whole place don't get flipped. Woke up seeing this on every blog like they know I'm coming, LOL. Then DJ Academic says, this is all this stupid nigga had to tweet. Coming out here trying to beef with me to sell a record like I made this shit up. Meek really got to be on drugs, though. Nigga been chill on that nigga. Dean and half of Philly drove to my studio trying to expose a nigga in an interview. I turned the interview down off of the strength of 21 Savage, who tried to patch stuff up with me and him before. Meek don't talk to no nigga from Philly like how he talked to me. That's why I can't respect him. He bunny hop for the white man and act like he above niggas who from his own city but got killer energy for a blogger. Nigga, we stop believing in you. Then Meek says, somebody send me the actual lawsuit. 
these blogs making y'all stupid day for day. DJ X says, go to page 13, your name is redacted, but then you're explained as the Philly rapper who dated Nicki Minaj. Then he says, the day a nigga used a gay rumor and beefing with a blogger to promote a song is when I realized the game is too crazy for me. I'm a prey for me, but he got a back on them perks. Meek says he's an alcoholic with no life, talking to kids on a computer. Normal kids watch Kai, Aiden, and Wallow Gilly. You a sick old black man with no life achievements, trying to destroy black men because you envy us as men. Then Axe says, Meek, I promise you, nobody in the rap game envies you. Nigga, you got dropped from Atlantic. Then said you heard execs were planning against you. Nigga, you flat out fell the fuck off. Who you think is in rooms conspiring? Let's try to stop Meek Mill. We're jealous. You high? So that was their goofy back and forth. So Usher hasn't said anything. You know, Usher's quiet right now, tending to his wife. Now I find it very funny that he ran off and got married real quick. But um, what's interesting is that a lot of people have been putting clips together um, of Meek Mill and Usher with Diddy, and they've been real suspect. We've all seen the ones of Diddy and Usher when Usher was, you know, younger and um, when Diddy was talking about them waking up in the morning together and fighting over frosted flakes and all types of goofy stuff. But now there's even more video that's come out of Meek Mill kind of acting, you know, kind of sweet around Diddy. So a lot of people are going through Meek Mill's old tweets and there are old tweets from 2019 when he's saying this D is good as hell. He was even caught following a gay porn site. What's very interesting is that Meek was caught following a black gay porn account on Twitter. And it's really Meek Mill's um, name. Um, I think he tried to run to unfollow them, but people got the screenshots. They got the video recordings and stuff like that. Um, so that was very suspect. And then people were saying that a few months ago, I don't know how real this is, but this was floating around Twitter. They said that basically um, he had posted this by accident and it was up for a few seconds. And it says, I purchased a 10 inch super long realistic dildo for women waterproof ultra soft silicone dildo lifelike penis. Um, he got it on Amazon and he had posted that on his um, Twitter. And so then he came back and says, how do you unlink your Twitter from your Amazon account? This is urgent. And this was like a few months ago or something like that. So people were talking about that. Then there's all those weird videos of him and Diddy um, in matching outfits with some little short, you know, small man. Um, it's just very odd. Like, why are you guys matching in these silk outfits? Meek is leaning into him. They look like they just got done running the train on little man. It's just a weird picture. And then there's a picture of Meek in the pool and Diddy is calling him daddy. Hey, what's up, King Son? Man, you doing it, man. You deserve it, daddy. You putting in that work. I'm proud of you. I love you. Yeah. And then also, what's also really disturbing is that there's a video of Meek in that same red studio with the red lights with Diddy. And Meek is like rapping and singing and Diddy turns around and he's so, you know, happy and mystified. And then there's a video that Nicki Minaj was talking to Soulja Boy and she's trying and she's kind of low key calling out the DL guys in the industry and a lot of people are saying that she's low key talking about Meek and Diddy. Do you think it's a lot of undercover brothers in the industry? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh no, queen. We don't know nothing about undercovers. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> we don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> Because uh, I do. And then, of course, everybody's talking about the infamous song with Diddy and Usher where he was saying, you know, they would play fight undercovers. You know, uh, you was more than my girl. We was like brothers. More than my girl. We was like brothers. All night we would play fight undercovers. Now you gone, can't love you like I really want to. Like those lyrics were weird back when we were kids. And even now as an adult, seeing how Diddy gets down, the lyrics are super weird. And then there's also a video of Usher floating around. It came from 2017. 
And he's sweating. He's rapping to Biggie Smalls. And Diddy happens to be in the background. And he just looks super excited. So there's all types of clips that people are putting together. And then when it comes to the sex trafficking thing, and I've been thinking this for a while, and I know a lot of people have been talking about this on social media. If you guys remember, like, a year ago, he was running really hard with Zeus Network. Him and Lemmy and Natalie, they were all like, you know, really good friends. They were running with Krishan. Remember Krishan was running with Young Miami. They were all at Diddy's party. Diddy get Krishan rock her flowers and she turns up at his birthday party. <laughs> They went to Halloween with Diddy when he was a joker. And Zeus Network has been accused recently of running a sex trafficking ring. You know, um, Stunner Girl was saying that a lot of the girls on Zeus Network are fucking the producer. They're fucking security guards. They're selling pussy on Zeus Network. And it's very interesting that Diddy was really tapped in with them, you know, before all this drama hit the fan. And now I'm wondering if some of those girls, some of those baddies or some of those people who even tried out for the show may have been some of the people who were passed down to Diddy from Zeus Network. Just a theory. Just saying. Check this out. Why they bringing certain bitches back and they're doing hostings and all this shit? Because all these bitches is so... I remember around that time, I really couldn't say that because I was working there. If y'all wonder why, like, certain people be fighting, y'all never know, like, what happened? Like, where, what happened from this day to this day? Like, what happened that fast? And bitches be fighting over straight. I always would be headbutting with these people because I'm a bitch that came and I got muscle behind me. Niggas can't just yell at me and tell me, like, how these, they be talking to these bitches like dirt. They can't yell at me like dirt and talk to me like dirt, like, that's why if y'all really, if y'all really realize, I only got cool with motherfuckers around my birthday. Before that, you never see me outside with these people, none of that. Because we were always at war, like we were always bumping heads in that war. Because I'm not one of them little fun girls. I'm not fresh, 20, and I'm, um, don't got a boyfriend, and I'm just willing to do whatever. Like, I'm not one of those. So I literally was always in... What's that word? I literally was always bumping heads with these people because they can't just talk to me any type of fucking way. Like, can't yell at me, can't, bitch, get up and get, you can't do that. You can't talk to me like that. Um, I'm not using my pussy to get what I want. I never let motherfuckers play with me. Motherfuckers couldn't play with me. That's why it was crazy when a bitch tried to come on here and lie and say that I was doing A, B, and C. And it was like, I've never done it. I was like the only bitch not doing shit like that. All right, so you guys just saw those clips. And now last but not least, um, Tiffany Red is once again speaking out. And she's basically come out and she's saying that she is going to sue Diddy. She is upset. She's going through it. And she said everything in that lawsuit is the truth. Again, she's also the same person who came out and had Cassie's back as well. So I want you guys to listen to what Tiffany Red had to say. Y'all expect me to be fucking quiet? You want an interview? This is my life in real life. That's Lil Rod's life in real life. That's Cassie's life in real life. And all this shit y'all doing on the internet is putting everybody in danger. I'm not outside because it's dangerous. You tell me who else gets to be accused of all kind of this kind of shit that ain't going to get picked up and be in jail already. What did George Floyd die for? Some fake ass money. That's all it took. And all of this, this nigga still outside. And y'all want me to come to meetings? Y'all want me to go do shit? Are you fucking serious? This is not a drill. This is real. This is real life. I'm exhausted with this shit, y'all. I am exhausted with this shit. And I'm so hurt. And I'm so sad. 
I can't believe I'm about to cry on the internet. But I'm so hurt and I'm so sad because for the last four years, all I've been trying to do is make this shit better. This is the reason why I quit. Y'all ask me why I don't write songs anymore. This is why. This shit has made me want to kill myself. I'm fighting suicidal ideations as we speak. Because this is no way to live. <laughs> this is no way to live. I just wanted to do records. I just wanted to write songs. I did not sign up for this shit. I was not raised like this. I don't want to do the drugs. I don't want to fuck. You want to know why I don't got a bunch of hits for all y'all that are like, she ain't got no hits. Them hits was behind me laying on my back, bitch. That's why I don't got them records. Because I'm not willing to get fucked. Because I got a daddy that'll hurt you. And I care about my family. So I'm not going to put my family in that position. So I quit. The thing I love. The thing I'm amazing at. The, th the thing that God blessed me with. <sighs> we don't deserve this, y'all. There's so many people getting hurt just trying to make music that do not deserve this. So there you have it. I'm suing Puff. I'm suing Interscope. I'm suing Epic. I'm suing Bad Boy. For all the music that I have written for Cassie that was derailed. I'm suing for my career that they took from me. That I earned. That I worked for. And for all of y'all who don't have the courage to do what I'm doing. To do what little Rod is doing. To do what Cassie is doing. Shut the fuck up. Shut up. Alright, so you guys just heard what Tiffany Red had to say. And my heart definitely breaks for her. You can tell she's been through a lot in the industry. Very talented young woman. And she's just not getting her just dues as a songwriter, as a talent. As someone who got a lot of people's careers to where they need to be. And she's just kind of been left in the dust. So with her coming out the woodwork and saying that she's going to sue Diddy and the record labels as well. Man, like I said, 2024 is the year of exposure. You know, I've called it out. Cat Williams has called it out. Once again, Cat Williams, a gift that keeps on giving. Four times, just to protect my integrity and that virgin hole I was telling you about. <laughs> right, because uh, P. Diddy be wanting to party. And you got to tell him no. Oh, you Lord. got to tell him no. I, I did. Hell. I did. Oh, See, I got the receipts for everything I'm telling you. That Cat dropped so many damn jewels in that Club Shay Shay interview. We're going to be talking about that damn interview with our grandkids. Watch. It, this this interview is literally the, the things that legends are made of. So with that being said, I look forward to reading y'all's comments. Let me know what you guys think about all this drama concerning Diddy, Meek Mill, Usher, Tiffany Red. Make sure you guys leave a comment down below. Please share the video. Make sure you guys like the video. Most importantly, make sure you're still subscribed to the channel. And I'll talk to y'all later. Deuces. If you want the latest news in the streets, join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sell your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe.